cool. Let's see if we're up and running. Excellent, primo good. All right, what's going on here? Cool. Hello, welcome. Philosophy Roulette number 234, I believe. Probably somewhere around there. I'm over 230, though. Probably 234. Maybe 235. But what we do here is we read and review philosophy papers live for the viewing audience on Twitch and later on the YouTubes if I ever remember to upload them. I've been lackadaisical. But that's okay. Lackadaisicality is not a crime. Um, so let's just see what's new. I had some uh, suggestions. I did a paper that was recommended um, not long ago. Um, just a, one or two uh, roulettes ago. I do take uh, requests from the audience and subscribers and followers and all the other folks that come by. So let's see. Ooh. Archive for... I can't even try to do that. Let's just see if we have this. What we got from uh, Archive and we can try the AJP. Can't all... Chris Gambler. I actually know Chris Gambler. He's here in New York. I mean, I guess he knows how to count then. Let's see if, uh, well, I guess he's trying to count more things. Let's see. Can all things be counted on academia? Let's find a, uh, wow. Wow. Thanks, academia. All right. That's terrible, man. In this paper, I present a modal set theory that reconciles mathematics after Cantor with the idea that there's only one size of infinity. Alrighty, well, that's fine. We're not going to read Chris's stuff then. So, anyway, I usually don't read 28 pages of something. So, that's okay. Gave it a uh, quick look. What were we looking at? How efficient causation works. Forthcoming. Uh, we'll take a no link. No link yet. Alright, so we don't know. Ooh, but the PDF might be here. 35 pages, not happening. 35 double space pages is like, oh, it's still a lot. So that's like 16 pages. Still could do that. But, uh, yeah, so maybe we can uh, come back to this. If you can't find anything else. I mean, 16 pages is kind of tough. But it, well, no, 35 pages is kind of tough. That's like 18 pages. So let's just take a look at what AJP has. Depicting movement. And that's 13 pages. That would be ideal. So, please be here. Please be here. It's not here. Please be on Google. Please be. Uh, let's find out what this links to. Oh, is this open access? Because if you can just click on it, it is. Well, how nice is that? 2 of 15. Um, That is very doable. So, this may be a uh, candidate for... Uh, being read. We can also go keep, go back and look real fast. Uh, no, not going to go back. Did I, uh, what I do? This is something old. Nope, here it is. By Solveig Ansen. Uh, Asen. Okay, but that's cool. So we can look at that. Let's see if AJP has anything else. Um, hmm. And this one is 14 pages. You disgust me, or do you, on the very idea of moral disgust. Iskra Faleva, second person in this stream I actually know. Uh, when I was an undergrad, Iskra was a grad student for a while there. So that's a uh, wow. All right, so let's see if uh, Iskra has her paper online. Uh, find it on Scholar. Oh no, it's not available. Iskra, please. Boo, I don't have access. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I feel like simple dint of knowing somebody I should put some more effort in, but not a whole lot I can do from right here, right now. But I'm going to not close the tab. How about that? 
That's what I will do. Of course, if anyone out there has a, in the watching audience has preferences, violent deaths, vicious preferences, and bare differences, I reply to Hill. I mean, this is five pages. I like five pages. I mean, let's get some philosophy done and done fast. Oh. What's that song? Uh, dirty deeds done dirt cheap. Let's get some philosophy done dirt cheap. That's what I want to see. Wait, was that available? I looked too quick. I thought I saw maybe an open access green thing real quick. Nope, it was just this green fooled me right here. Shucks. Dirty philosophy done dirt cheap. <laughs> uh, I think I was looking at this while being counterfactual, so that would be it for now. Can duties to the self bind if they're waivable? Another five page paper. You know, I thought the AJP had a I mean, these must be just over, it's a, uh, because it, AJP has a minimum word count. I know because I sent them something too short once and they were like, yeah, you should withdraw that or else, or else we'll just reject you. I was like, okay. So this must be like just over the word count. All right, so now we've got two from AJP. What do we want to read? Do we want to read, can duty self-bind? Heck, I got to check if I already re read this. I don't know. Um... Because I feel like I uh, read something on self-binding duties. Uh, shucks. I don't know. I don't know. So I can't read right now because I don't know if it's uh, actually something I can read. Because if I can't... <laughs> I don't want to go back and do a, a paper twice. I have done that once. I got halfway through a paper and I was like, oh no, I know how this paper ends. Yeah, that was bad. Does success entail a bit? Oh, we can look at news and we have, but I mean, we have some paper. So unless someone has a preference out there, I'm going to look quick at like news, although they always have their papers are too long. Um, the world is not enough. I mean, well, okay. If you're going to just go and get a uh, James Bond title, stealing a James Bond title, that is something. Um, Derek Parfit made the bold suggestion at various times under the heading of the normativity objection that anyone possess in possession of a normative concept is in a position to know on the basis of their competence with such comp concepts alone that reductive realism and ethics is not even possible. Despite the prominent role that the normativity objection plays in Parfit's non-reductive account of the nature of normativity, when the objection hasn't been ignored, it's criticized and even derided. So let's see, well, the world is not enough. Is it available to, like, look at? It's right here. All right, so then you get 16 pages. Uh, yeah, 16 pages and very small. I don't know. Maybe I'll hold on to that for later just because of the title. But let's see, anything else here? Nah. Okay, so let's go back real quick. and Let's see, what, anything else? Oh, yeah, we're going to look at philosophy real fast. Death, deprivation, and the afterlife. That's a fun topic. Everyone likes to talk about death. DeMarshall, what is up? How are you tonight? I hope you're doing well. A Unitarian case for a Russellian panpsychism. Sounds like fun. Culpably creating the conditions of justified acts. Another look. This is another short paper. Like hopefully this is here because I got the uh, another five-page paper. In this article, I, how one's minor culpability in giving rise to an instance otherwise justified defense, uh, blah, blah, blah. Well, let's see if it's here. I can't get it. I can't read it. All right. Let's see if there's anything else. Luck for moral luck. Yeah, I think I've read one of these old... <laughs> this is funny. I think I read the one that they're uh, talking about, No Luck for Moral Luck. Um, I think I read that one. And now they're reading... This is someone disagreeing with that paper. Sosa's Safety Condition and Problem of Philosophical Skepticism. Interesting. The Anti-Jewish Narrative. Ooh. 
According to the mainstream narrative of race, all groups have the same innate disposition and potential, and all disparities, at least those favoring whites, are due to past or present racism. Some people who reject this narrative gravitate toward an alternative anti-Jewish narrative which sees recent history in terms of Jewish-Gentile conflict. The most sophisticated promoter of the anti-Jewish narrative is the evolutionary psychologist Kevin MacDonald, and MacDonald argues that the Jews have a suite of genetic adaptations. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, it's just funny I know plenty of Jews And they ain't all smart <laughs> I feel like you get like the bad media version Of everybody like nowadays It's like every like Jew is one way Every Muslim is another Every like white Christian American guy Is like gun toting in America It's like oh dear lord And then they go and they get like studies That like agree with this It's like no that's The world's a little bit more complicated than that Anywho, all right, let's go back. What did I have? We had this depicting movement. That sounded like fun. So let's go uh, do this depicting movement. Unless, DeMarshall, you have a choice. I got depicting movement. Um, we also have Aristotle on how efficient causation works, because I'd like to know about that too. And what else was there? And this is old. Yeah, nope, so I had these two. Uh, did I have something else? Uh, nope. Alright, so we'll go for this one. Let's download this file. Cool. Why do we have embedded? Don't know what that even means. Okay, so we now have got something to read. 15 pages from the Australasian Journal of Philosophy, depicting movement by Solveig Asen. I apologize for how I say your name and every other non very like typical American English name. <sighs> hmm, let's go. Oh, let me give you the link if you, anyone wants to jump in on this. Cool. So, yeah, if anyone is joining, you can always type exclamation point paper, like exclamation point here, but you type exclamation point paper, and this link will pop back up. So, cool. So, yeah, depicting movement and by Solveig Asen. When I see the picture of a galloping horse, do I only know that this is the kind of movement meant? Is it supposed is it superstition to think I see the horse galloping in the picture? And does my visual impression gallop too? So this is uh, Wittgenstein, part 11 of Philosophical Investigations. I know this section because this is where duck rabbits are. And if you didn't notice, there's like duck rabbits and stuff on my stream. I like duck rabbits. And so this is, uh, I've read this section a bit, I think. So we'll see. Yeah, section 175. Although I haven't read that in a while, to tell you the truth. I usually actually focus on 10, not 11, which is kind of funky. Okay, and we're talking about pictures again. We talked about pictures uh, last time. Introduction. Pictures contrast with their depicta. Wow, I haven't seen depicta. Because busting out the big words, or the funky words, right in the first sentence. In some striking ways. A picture is flat, but can depict three-dimensional objects. A picture is a static display, but can depict something that moves. If pictures worked like the language, this would not be puzzling insofar as linguistic representation is conventional and anything can represent anything by convention. But in contrast to language, pictures represent by, in some sense or other, letting us see something in them. Thus, there is a puzzle. How can we see in a flat, static surface something three-dimensional that moves? The part of this puzzle that concerns the spatial discrepancy between two-dimensional vehicle, a two-dimensional vehicle of depiction and a three-dimensional depictum has received much attention in the philosophical literature on depiction. Uh, see these folks if you are interested. 
But the part that concerns the spatiotemporal discrepancy between a static vehicle and a moving depictum remains underexplored. In this paper, I articulate this latter part of the puzzle in section 2 and consider some solutions in section 3. I suggest that one of the solutions can be extended to depictions of relatively static objects and scenes in section 4, and thereby aim to renew our conception of what depiction of movement is. Okay, so what it looks like is, how are we going to, it's not so much that, like, flat images depict movement, but they also depict movement in time, it sounds like. So it's not just that we're representing three dimensions and two dimensions, it's we're representing three dimensions plus the fourth temporal dimension. So that's kind of we're going the next step past the two-dimensional flat surface into a temporal dimension as well. Okay. So that's, uh, well, we'll see. The puzzle. Clarifying what is puzzling about depiction of movement presupposes that some paintings or photographs depict movement or things in movement. In the limited debate that exists on depiction of movement, this claim is relatively uncontroversial. So all these folks, I guess, say it is. For instance, Rosa Bonner's The Horse Fair seems to depict horses moving with great force. At least on part of Bonner's achievement is that the depicted horses do not look like they are standing in unrealistic ways, for instance, maintaining poses that look impossible to balance or hovering above ground. It looks like they are galloping or rearing. In so far as one accepts, as I will in this paper, that this is how things look in Bonhur's picture, one accepts that the picture depicts movement or equivalently that we see movement in the picture. Alright, so what's this? Uh yeah, see I was gonna say, look, there's another way to say it. It's not that we see the movement, but then we see a depiction, which is exactly what that footnote right here that I just scrolled down to uh see was uh get. So, so we see movement or do we see the depiction of movement? And, you know, it sounds like it might be a big, big difference to say, well, we actually see the movement in a static picture or we see someone depicting like a picture, like a two, a flat non-movement. We don't actually see the movement. We see some sort of representation of the movement that was like fixed in a two dimensional thing. Usually, even though that sounds like you're like solving the entire problem there, it actually never seems to ever work out in philosophy. So just throwing in the next sort of step to say that we see like a representation that is not moving, moving of movement doesn't usually work. And, you know, that's an interesting question why that is. Like, why is that sort of analysis so tempting but always failing? I don't know. That I might think about. But for now, I guess this author is just going to say, no, when we see that picture of what looks like an, a horse galloping, that's what we see. We see the movement in the picture. Okay, how should we characterize what is puzzling about depictions like this one by Bon Hur? The puzzle seems to rise from two observations. One, some pictures depict movement. Two, pictures are themselves static. Conjoined, these raise the question, how can a static surface depict a moving object or scene? This is not yet the formulation of a puzzle as opposed to a mere question. It would be a puzzle if we could presuppose that depiction is what Curie calls a homomorphic form of representation, representing like with like. Then one could only depict movement by means of something that moves, and it would be very puzzling indeed, seemingly impossible, that a static surface can depict movement. But we need only remind ourselves of the possibility of depiction of three-dimensional objects by means of two-dimensional surface if we are to be convinced that depiction is not homomorphic. Yeah. So, immediately the author is setting up a analogy, saying that the temporal dimension is sort of like the third dimension, not it. It's like a three-dimensional picture can be represented by a two-dimensional picture. A three-dimensional scene can be represented by a two-dimensional picture, just like a moving scene can be represented by a static scene. Now, is that analogy fair? I don't know, but that's exactly what this author seems like they're setting up right here, right now. That three dimensions can be represented by two dimensions, just like a temporal dimension, a moving picture, can be represented by a static picture, non-moving. Okay. Notably, the fact that depiction is not homomorphic raises its own puzzle. All picture perception is mysterious in that the nature of the stimulus of the picture surface differs from the nature of what we see in it. 
What is seen might be big, warm, and at last and last for a short time, while the picture may be small, relatively cold, and last for a long time. This raises a question of how as to how non-homomorphic depiction is possible, but the puzzle about depiction of movement is more specific than that. Um I don't really get this, but like I think what the author is doing here is just, they're just trying to build up why this is an interesting problem. Um, the idea that like representation has to like somehow be similar to what it's representing. I don't know if any like this homomorphism. I don't even know who actually holds this. Like this is, it seems almost like a. Uh, straw man like who actually holds that what you're representing has to be like what you're act the represented like if you have a map there's nothing on like the map and ink and paper that is like the land that the map represents like there's no trees on the paper like it's not it's like yeah it's made of crushed trees or like if you have a map on your phone it's not like the trees are in the phone like it's not made of the same stuff so I'm not sure what this homomorphic is, uh, how, like, like, fundamental that really is. I mean, any representation, that's the whole point, is that it's in some other, um, that you're not doing it. Hey, Bubba Bloop, what's up? How you doing? Hope you're doing well. We're reading a paper on, uh, depicting movement, and, like, so if you have, like, a, static picture just you know two-dimensional picture how do you represent movement in a uh picture just that 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 doesn't itself move if we're not in the harry potter universe of course okay continuing yeah and anyone out there please feel free to ask questions in order to formulate the puzzle, we need to identify a conflict between the dynamic element and the static element. One could attempt to do this by using one's favorite theory of depiction. It is not clear that every such theory can construe depiction of movement as puzzling. For instance, given an experienced, re experienced resemblance theory of depiction, there is a question as to how a static surface can be experienced as resembling a moving object or scene. But to the extent that anything can be experienced as resembling anything else, there is no obstacle to depicting movement on this theory. Identifying an obstacle would require introducing restrictions on experience, experienced resemblance to movement. Instead of presupposing a particular theory of depiction, which might not be sub sub might not be sufficient for formulating a puzzle anyway, I will seek to identify a conflict between the static and the dynamic element by taking a close look at these observations, 1 and 2, that seem to generate the puzzle. And 1 and 2 were saying that pictures depict movement and them, they themselves are not moving, they're static. So how do we do this? Okay, so some pictures depict movement. In order to clarify 1, it is useful to Consider some examples of how depiction of movement can be achieved. I have already mentioned Bonheur's The Horse Fair. You know, in this case, it would have been good if um, this author, and I don't know um, if AJP has pictures allowed, but wouldn't it, it would have been nice if they could have thrown some picture in here. I'm sure there's something that's like out of copyright that could have been used. Okay, cool. Thank you for lurking, Bubba Bloop. I appreciate the lurk. Cheers. Yeah, I think people have gotten busy. I know you're getting busy, too, lately. So, it happens. Can't hang out as much as you want. But I am working on the uh, Minesweeper updates. I was doing that before the stream today. So, we'll see. I'm trying to think of how to do this. Everything's so complicated. It's crazy. Anywho, yeah. See, I, I'm always looking for examples in philosophy and... Uh, this one, like, if, you, if you're talking about pictures, can't you just go find yourself a nice picture? Hey, cheers to Marshall. Okay. I've already mentioned Bonheur's The Horse Fair. Bonheur portrays horses in positions that they cannot maintain for a very long time. For instance, as standing on two feet. That might be one strategy for depicting movement. A similar strategy might be to portray people in action. This is an achievement that Rembrandt allegedly pioneered in the Night Watch. 
Another stra strategy might be, instead of exploiting features of the motif, to use a certain style to create blur or to make the direction of brush strokes indicate direction of movement. This seems to be what creates the sense of a rolling sea in JWM Turner's Snowstorm. It can also be achieved in photography by using long exposure time to create streaky photos. I take the examples mentioned to be some of the paradigmatic examples of depiction of movement. I mean, I can even think of like older ones like, uh, I mean, these are, I mean, from a few hundred years ago, but I mean, you could have like religious paintings from like, who knows when, seeing people ascend to he heaven or whatever from earlier Okay, there are also some borderline cases to consider. Jackson Pollock made works like 1, number 31, 1950, by placing the canvas on the floor and then pouring, dribbling, and flicking paint onto it. Turner is pretty, okay, Turner is pretty good though? Okay, I'll take your word for it. I can't, uh, see, I can't draw this up in memory right now. Like, I might be able to, I probably have seen it, but, um, that's why I like examples here, because, you know, I'm just, slow sometimes <laughs> and I like to just just give me the picture although I actually I have seen this Jackson Pollock somewhat recently so I know what this one actually looks like I was in the moment not too long ago I mean it was before corona but it wasn't long before corona so according to MoMA the painting is a visual record of gestures and actions yeah because I mean it's one of those drip paintings so it's like you, if you try to figure out like, one of the things about looking at one of his drip paintings is that if you try to figure out how he actually got all the drips to, like, layer on each other, it's really hard to do. Because he somehow made a incredible amount of layering between his lines. And, um, so it's like, if you try to figure out how it, it was actually constructed, it's like, it gets very complex very fast. So, in some sense, a visual record of gestures and actions... It's like, if you could try to recall the construction of the painting, then yes. I'm not entirely sure that's what you get by looking at it. You don't normally look at, think about the construction. But if you think about the construction, then yes, you get that. And oh yeah, how, thanks for stopping by, Valpo. Good to see you. How are you today? Hope you're well. Continuing. My reasons for thinking that this is not a depiction of movement are that one, we see traces of movement and not movement itself when looking at this picture, and two, even if one thinks that seeing these traces is to see a past movement made by Pollock, that past movement is seen not in the picture but rather on the painted surface. In the paradigmatic examples mentioned above, by contrast, movement is seen in the picture. Okay, so this is what I was just saying, that you kind of have to change your mode of view viewing to think about what Pollock was doing uh, in construction of it. I'm not sure that actually that this distinction works right here, that the construction is separate from the thing represented in the picture. Perhaps that is what is represented in the picture. I'm not one to say that, um, to claim that's like one way or the other. But I mean, you can make this distinction as the uh, author here is doing, but I actually, I'm not sure if that, um, that holds. So like maybe what the Pollock painting does is represent how it was made for all i know okay but yeah we can call that a borderline case another borderline case is constituted by paintings like uh david's the nativity yes this is what i was thinking older stuff where the direction of the depicted people's gaze or pointing gestures draws the spectator's gaze toward what is pointed or gazed at in this case the newborn christ in the center of the picture this is exactly what i was thinking of when i mentioned religious art that goes from way back when there's always some sort of uh, upward movement or movement towards christ um in these sorts of uh these this genre it's there's definitely some sort of direction directionality here while art historians would say that there is movement in this picture, I would not count it as a depiction of movement. There is movement of the spectator's eyes, but no movement is seen in the picture. Again, you could call it borderline, and maybe you could make a case that this is a legit form of movement. But um, this author is not talking about that, and I guess that's fine. <laughs> I'm always so happy when I get anything right, Valpo. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Thanks for noticing. 
A third category of borderline cases are optical illusions of movement. For instance, Bridget Wh Riley's current exploits the McKay, this person likes the MoMA, exploits the McKay illusion and creates an experience of a wave-like horizontal movement in a pattern of close curved vertical lines. Another example is Monet's poppy field, where as Livingston explains, low luminescence is common contrast. Low luminance contrast is used to create the illusion that the poppies in the field change position. There is interesting work in the psychology and neuroscience explaining why these optical effects arise. However, focusing instead on how optical illusions versus depictions of movement look, there are two notable differences in the mentioned paradigmatic cases of depiction of movement. One difference is that the illu illusory movement is seen on the surface and not in the picture. Monet's poppy field is a useful example since it is both a depiction and an illusion of movement. The illusory movement is a movement of red spots on a green background surface. Their movement might well contribute to oopsie, contribute to there being a depicted movement on the field as the wind blows across it, seen in pictorial space. But the illusory movement of the red spots is not located in pictorial space. All right, so I actually want to maybe push back on this illusion one. You can represent movement via illusion in the painting or in the picture what you got to think of is um mc escher is you know the guy walking up constantly up the stairs or the water um the impossible waterfall in mc escher's um work and i could probably just pull that up real fast let me uh look So yeah, so like you can see that. Um, where's my the normal staircase? So like say this. Uh, come on, let's get bigger here, would we? So like here, so if we look at like this thing, where is the movement of the water? It's represented in the picture, but it's also represented by the illusion, and the illusion actually goes to help create the uh movement if there was no movement in the picture there would be no illusion either and so the illusion might do more work than i think this author is giving it credit for how exactly i'm not sure like i'd have to think about this but like this picture right here the illusion wouldn't work as well if there was no running water and the running water is also has to do with, like makes the illusion and that's what makes it so interesting it's it's part of both so okay so let's just go back real quick so i'm not sure that the illusion like the optical illusions are so far away okay a second difference between how illusions and depiction of movement look is that only the former seem to currently move. In Riley's current, the movement seems to be happening now. In pictures like Bonheur's The Horse Fair, by contrast, the galloping horses do not seem to move at a time simultaneous with our own temporal present. Nevertheless, they look to be in movement. Alright, so this is fair enough. I mean, the author is allowed to like define what kind of movement they're talking about here. The few points made about the borderline cases versus depiction of movement are by no means exhaustive, but they place some restrictions on the formulation of our puzzle. In order to have a puzzle and not a mere question, we need to identify an obstacle to depicting movement by means of a static surface. One might think that the obstacle is that a static surface cannot seem to move. Accounts of illusion might have to explain this away. But in depiction of movement, the surface does not seem to move. Rather, something that looks to be in movement without currently moving is seen in the surface. Thus, our search for the formulation of a puzzle proceeds with the following query. Is there an obstacle to depicting something that looks to be in movement by means of a static surface? In order to make progress, I suggest that we examine what is meant by saying that pictures are static. Okay, so this is fine. This is the author again. Like I was saying, the construction of this paper is to like set up the problem the author wants to talk about, which is this one here all right so this stuff here is like kind of what is this is the uh, what the author wants to talk about and basically everything up to this point is just trying to set this up so what what are we talking about this is all just sort of preamble to uh asking the question they want to talk about 
Um, as far as writing paper goes, I mean, it's fine. You just sort of, you know, this is a, this is the warm up. <laughs> and really, this is what the, I think they wanted to talk about right here. The uh, pictures are static, and they're gonna say pictures are not actually static. So how do you do that? Well, you, how do you say pictures are in motion? You say, well, they never were static to begin with, and that's like I think <laughs> the general philosophical strategy. But we feel, we will find out. The observation that pictures are static is rooted in a distinction between temporal and spatial arts. As Fodor puts it, where a spoken language and music are presented in time, pictures are presented in space. Pictures, one might therefore conclude, cannot present something that takes time, such as movement or duration, insofar as something that takes time must be presented in time. Oh yeah, and one more comment on the construction of a paper. People can't control themselves, and it's not like that philosophers are special people it's like you ask a question you immediately answer it like that's just kind of what we do it's like people it's like you got you finally ask the question they want to ask right here and then you answer it immediately it's like it's just this is how we are it's like you got all you got yourself all worked up you want the answer <laughs> uh, but it is but is it true that pictures are present in only in space Pictures are, after all, spatio-temporal objects and are thus presented in both time and space. In fact, some pictures are presented over a very long time, sometimes several centuries. Moreover, the space used to present them during that time, the picture surface, might, as painting conservators are very aware, change. The colors fade and cracks appear on the surface. What does not change, interestingly, is what we see in the picture. It might become more difficult to see when the colors fade, but it does not change. Thus, one might think that the, pic the place to look for picture static nature is in our experience of the surface, rather than the surface itself. Perhaps pictures are static in the sense that the temporal properties of our, ex of our experience of the surface make no difference to the temporal properties of what we see in it. All right, so now we've got a distinction. Where is the staticness of a painting? And they're saying it's actually not the painting because, you know, and this goes back to, I think, Dreyfus and a few other people. Um, in the phenomenology when you go look at a painting you never are just like you're not like fixed in front of the painting unless you're of course looking at the Mona Lisa and you can't move because there's so many people around you but like every other time you're moving left right you look forward back it's in time in space even though it is a flat surface which it may not be flat because of the uh, paint coming off the surface is not always flat but like it's not ever just a flat surface that you are seeing from a single angle I mean, even like this internet stuff where everything is kind of like right in front of us, that's a very new thing. And even then you're probably scrolling, so it's still moving. Walton, 08, seems to think so. He construes the puzzle about depiction of movement as concerning a conflict between the duration of what is depicted and the duration of the experience of it in the picture. On the assumption that what is depicted is a momentary state or a very short time slice, he asks how it can be that we may continue seeing the momentary state of affairs for five minutes or an hour or all day. Walton thus seems to pre presuppose that the unpuzzling case is when our experiences of something temporally extend ex of something temporally extended last for the same amount of time as does what is experienced. Correspondingly, the puzzle is this: How is it possible for the duration of the visual experience of a picture to differ from the duration of what is seen in it? Okay. So yeah, so now we've got two durations, like two durations. We've got a duration of what is depicted in the, in the picture and our experience duration of it. So we have a duration of our experiencing of the thing in the picture. So it's more like, you know, one of those, um, what's it called? When like a movie goes into slow-mo and like, so you have the time to walk around in the, the, in the movie and, like, even though the, the time is still progressing, but very slowly, you're somehow, like, you can, like, look at stuff. So this happens in uh, Keanu Reeve, Reeves' movies, like, um, what's it called? The Matrix, like, where he can sort of, like, time can stop and slow down, and he can look at stuff. It also can happen, it also happened in, uh, what's it called? Where he's a supernatural investigator, it's from a comic book. Oh, shucks. But anyway, he's uh, the the devil shows up and time slows down, and like you can walk around in time, 
and like the devil can walk around it time is still continuing but like the devil can just walk among us like real like we're, we're all moving in slow-mo the devil's moving fast comparatively so how is it that like when we experience the picture we are kind of in the slow motion and the picture is like is like that little time slice of the picture but we sort of are in like caught in like a very short time we have a long time slice whereas the picture is a very short time slice so this is where the author has ended up right here and so how are we getting multiple time slices okay continuing and please anyone out there let me know if you have questions if this is the puzzle about depiction of movement it would not be the specific to depiction of it would not be specific to depiction of movement it would be a sub puzzle of the following puzzle about temporal experience how can the duration of what one perceives differ from the duration of the perceptual experience to my mind this does not seem right experiential responses to pictures differ significantly from the responses to objects and scenes face to face for instance, flat picture surfaces can give rise to experiences of three-dimensional objects. When this is found puzzling, this is usually not treated as a sub-puzzle of a more general puzzle about how we experience flat objects as three-dimensional. The puzzle arises because we are experiencing a picture. Similarly, I think that it is because we are seeing a picture that we are able to see an object that looks to be in a to be in movement in a static surface. While it may in general be puzzling that one can experience something of a short duration for a long time, if one indeed can, it is not puzzling that this can happen in a picture. What is puzzling is how it can. Uh, I don't know if this is fair. Like, what does it mean to be a picture? Like, it's putting a lot of work... Uh, just because something arises because we're experiencing a picture, I don't know what a picture actually means here. I mean... I mean, you close one of your eyes, or if you just can't, you don't have three-dimensional view, I mean, then everything's kind of two-dimensional, and then, like, you still are experience. It, you don't, it's not a picture, it's a, uh, that's just your experience, and you don't need it to be in a picture for it to be two-dimensional. It's like, okay, that's not very hard to do. So I'm not 100% sure, like, this because we are experiencing a picture line right here. Granted, I don't think this has any effect on the argument, but like I can see why they're pushing it. Why are they pushing this? Because they want to keep the question of how we can experience two different times, two different durations at once. So this is trying to just remove it from... This is trying to just keep focus here is what's going on. Um, yeah, just trying to keep this here and here. These two things lined up. Okay. Thus, explicating the static nature of pictures in terms of the experience of the surface does not look promising. The surface is the key to expl explicating how pictures are static, I think, not the surface's temporal properties. As we observe above, these change. For instance, the colors fade. But there's something about the surface that makes possible the characteristics characteristic picture experience more specifically i suggest that the surface is static in the sense of always remaining unchanged in the way that it accomplishes its presenting of what we see in it that is a picture is static in that the way the picture presents what we see in it does not change as history progresses even if the picture surface should change i don't think this is a yeah they have qualifications right here i was gonna say i was like that's not entirely case um and it might even be uh wrong in certain kinds of uh artworks a few years back um there was some sculpture that they decided they want to clean and they hired some guy without art history background and sculpt uh or our restoration to clean it he was some like local you know cleaning guy and he came in looked at the uh, material it was made out of that uh like the, it was a marble sculpture or something and it was just very old and very grimy and he just you know he said you know what i've got a uh cleaning material that he blasted it he says it won't damage it i know because he was competent as cleaning stuff he says i'm gonna blast it with this like these like little small like soft pellets it will clean all the gunk away and you will get back to the original marble surface and he did this and it the artwork was like stunningly white and this freaked people out because 
you know what? They think they they actually thought that the grime contributed to the artwork. That perhaps the because I think this was a a coffin or some sort of a death sort of a sculpture. They were think they and the art historians start thinking. We think that the sculpture the sculptor knew what they were doing, in that they knew that the wear that the sculpture would uh, get over the years would enhance the artwork. And so I'm not entirely sure that even if the picture surface should change, that the, the way it presents its art, um, what it presents does not change. Like, because this was a uh, controversy a few years ago um, that this happened. <laughs> not going to end well. No, it, it ended fine. You know, you know what the funny part was about it? It was like it was a much much to do about nothing. It's like they couldn't re-grime up the uh, artwork, but it's gonna happen anyway. It's like give it enough time, it's gonna get grimy again, and they'll get back to the way it was. But like you know, this was it wasn't like anything was really ruined. It was just ruined for a little while, and so it was kind of a funny thing. But this is what I mean: that you know sometimes artworks are across time, and just because you're calling it a painting or a picture, that doesn't mean that it. It doesn't have this sort of temporal aspect to it, too. Um, again, I'm nitpicking here because um, this is again, if you just read what the author is saying, in the you know understanding that they're trying to limit what they're talking about, just get focused on in a narrow area, then that's fine. Like, but like, uh, it, it, what they're saying more generally, I could have an uh, an argument with. But if you're just looking at this in terms of what the author, or the problem the author is trying to solve, everything's fine here. All right, continuing. Yeah, I I always want to see a picture of that like sculpture. I forgot. I think I might have. Uh, should look it up. Okay. In order for the author's suggestion to work, it is crucial that the notion of presentation that we are using does not just collapse into representation. The idea, then, would be identical to the one that we are seeking to elucidate, namely that pictures are static representations. Let me, therefore, elaborate a little on what I mean by saying that pictures present in a static way. Presenting statically is not identical to using something unchanging to represent. Even if pictures even if picture surfaces, contrary to fact, did not fade in color, etc., they would not necessarily present statically. Rather, the key idea concerns which aspect of the surface's nature matter, which aspects of the surface's nature matter to what we see in it. This is perhaps more readily appreciated with regard to the surface's flatness. <laughs> to present something flatly is not identical to using a flat thing to represent. A picture surface might be wrapped around a column and hence be a convexly curved surface, or it might become creased or full of cracks due to bad maintenance. But what we see in the surface or when seeing it as a picture is not affected by the, cur the curves, creases, and cracks, other than they can make it harder to see. So the picture, rep so the picture presents the flat way in the sense that any three-dimensional features of it would be irrelevant to what is seen in it okay again just limiting let's say we're not we're not talking about any three-dimensionality of these pictures i mean it is this is kind of unfair though all painting is like paint is never like completely flat it really isn't if you get close to a lot of the oil paints like some of the the painters really put it on thick so and you know, some if you go into a church, there's a famous paper in biology called the. Uh, uh, is it so hard to like pull things up when in the middle of reading? But it talks about the uh, spandrels of uh, a cathedral, and you know, the how beautiful they are. But like in some sense, they are enhanced by being where they are. So it's like you know, maybe the. Um, place where things are which is three-dimensional can affect a painting but like again if you take this w the way the author wants it's fine they're just talking about just flat pictures which we can have and basically which all of us mostly look at now when we're looking at screens exactly i mean a lot of thick paint laying on thick okay continuing we can explain static 
presentation analogously. A picture surface might be held in one's hand and shaken, or it might contain movement internal to the surface, as when slightly mal- when a slightly malfunctioning LED screen is flickering. But we, but what we see in the surface when seeing it as a picture is not affected by the shaking and the flickering. Other than this, can make it harder to see. So the picture presents statically in the sense that any temporal features of it would be irrelevant to what is seen in it, or as Walton puts it, the temporal properties have no bearing on its representational content. As Walton points out, cinematic representations do not present their objects statically in this sense. Some temporal features of the surface would make a difference to what it represents. We can develop this idea as follows. Seeing a change on the surface can be to thereby see a change happening to what is represented. One might think that precisely this possibility is needed if we are to see something that looks to be in movement in a surface, but pictorial representation precludes it. If a surface is seen as a picture depicting, say, Mary by one part of the surface at one time and by another part another time, for instance, because one certain marks are erased from the surface and others are added, then one option would be to regard this as there being two different pictures at the different times. Another option would be to regard it as one picture that first depicted Mary at location 1 and then depicted her at location 2. But the picture, in contrast to cinema, stays silent on any connection between Mary's placement at the two locations. It stays silent on this because pictures present their objects in such a way that seeing the surface change cannot be to thereby see what is depicted, depicted change. And for this reason, it seems like it cannot depict movement. Okay, so the author's just saying here, if it is moving, that's not depicting movement. That's just plain movement. Like, and that's what uh, move. That's what movies are. You show the movement because it is moving. Um, pictures, though, don't do that. They depict movement. They don't. They're not moving themselves. Summing up, then, I think that we should exp- explicate pictures in static as static in terms of their characteristics, static manner of. Pre- presentation. This gives us a clear conflict between a static and a dynamic element. Something, say a horse, is seen in a surface and looks to be in movement, observation one, but it is all the time looking the same way in the sense that no change seems seen happening to the surface amounts to change seen happening to the horse. And that's observation two. So the puzzle about depiction of movement can be formulated thus. How can something that looks to be in movement be seen in a surface that all the time presents its object as looking the same way in the sense that seeing the surface cannot the surface change cannot be to thereby see the depicted object change okay a spatial aspect of this conflict generates the puzzle about depiction of three-dimensional objects pictures present things in the flat way but they need not present things as flat in contrast the spatio-temporal aspect of the conflict generates the puzzle about depiction of movement Pictures present things in in the static way, but they need not present things as static. Thus, there is an obstacle to depicting movement. The mode of presentation that is special to the picture seems to prevent it. And this is just a small gripe. After reading so many papers, you've got two sentences with colons in them. No, or three. Like, this is really the problem. And I am guilty of this. And so I always have to be careful about this. We've got three senses with three colons. Like, <laughs> I go back and I have to make sure I haven't done this myself. It's like the semicolon is your friend. <laughs> okay. Some attempts at solving the puzzle. And if anyone has any questions, let me know. I mean, I the, the author, I think, is laying this out nicely. I don't agree with, like, all the strategies here, but, like, thank you, DeMarshall. But, you know, it's just, like, I'm trying to, I think it's clear, but I don't always know. Some attempts at solving the puzzle. Where are we? 8 of 15. We're getting there. A solution to the puzzle developed in the previous section should resolve the conflict between the static nature of picture's manner of presentation and the dynamic nature of what is seen in the picture. The solutions can be divided into two groups, according to which side of the conflict is taken as the starting point. 1. Coming from the dynamic side, one starts from the observation that what we see in the picture looks to be in movement. Given that movement takes time, we can make this side unproblematic by hypothesizing that what we see in the picture is temporally extended. Something that is temporally extended can be in movement and hence can unproblematically look to be that way. What 
remains puzzling, however, and what needs to be explained by solutions of this first sort is how a temporally extended movement can be presented statically, in the sense that seeing the surface change cannot be to see the depicted object change. 2. Coming from the static side, one starts from the observation that what we see in the picture is all of the time presented as looking the same way, in the sense that the seeing the surface cannot be to see, seeing Seeing the surface change cannot be to see the depicted object change. This would be unproblematic to account for account for if we see in the picture is not temporally extended. For a change takes time and hence there will be no change to present by means of changes of the surface. There are two ways to make this denial, however. Either A, one can claim that what we see in the picture is at a moment, or B, one can claim that it is something atemporal. In either case, what remains puzzling and what needs to be explained by solutions of the second sort is how something that has no temporal extension can look to be in movement. In the next three subsections, I explore solutions of type 1, 2a, and b. Solution 1. What we see in pictures is temporally extended. The first solution is inspired by something I, that I once saw in one of the Harry Potter movies. A picture of the young wizard's parents is shown as a film clip constantly on repeat where the parents are caught in, in a rotational movement. Although the picture qualifies as a cinematic present representation, it inspires a solution to our puzzle. Just as the film clip of Harry's parents is running on repeat independently of Harry's temporal reality, the suggestion would be that the horse's movement in Bon Hur's picture is happening in a temporal reality that is independent of the spectators. Then there is no puzzle as to how something seen in that temporal reality can be in movement since it can be temporally extended. But we need to explain how this temporally extended movement can be presented in the same way forever as it would have to do if seen in a picture. Yeah, so it's just sort of defining that even though it looks static to us, it's still in movement in some sense. In that world, it's in motion. Just as pictures in Harry Potter's world are in motion, it's the same thing for our world. Okay. It would be compatible with the suggestion to claim that the temporal reality of the horse's movement is of the same kind that which uh, can, same kind as that which we experience in everyday life. Walton presupposes this when he suggests that the duration of what is depicted might come apart from the duration of our experience of the picture. But this leads to a problem. How long is the duration of the horse's movement? Three seconds? Walton op excuse me. Mm. Walton operates with the exact durations like this of what is depicted. The problem is that it seems unclear how pictures, especially non-photographic ones, can settle the exact duration of, of the movement seen in them. All right, I'm not sure why this is like killer, because we just don't know how long the picture is, the duration of the picture is for. Is that really so bad? Okay, yeah. Okay, and the author agrees. But perhaps this is not something that we have to settle. One can hold that the horse's movement in Bonheur's painting is such that there is no answer to the question as to how long it takes and exactly when it starts and ends. Klovicki proposes a similar idea when explaining how long exposure photographs can record temporal patterns. What gets recorded, he thinks, are temporal patterns without direction and determinate extension. There is before, now, and after, both to Klovicki's temporal patterns and to the inexact duration of the horse's movement. Okay, there is before, now, and after. So it's like you're saying a picture kind of encapsulates sort of a, a little bit of time. We don't know. It's just sort of relative. So that's what a picture is really capturing. It's this relative um, before, now, and after. And it's relative to the motion described, but it's not like you have to know exactly that it was four seconds. But you have to know relative to what the motion is, what is being described in a picture. That's the motion, that the temporal amount of time that matters. Okay. What is remarkable is that, from the perspective of the spectator, what happens before, now, and after can be seen all at once. That is why it is possible on the solution to the puzzle for a picture to, re to present something in movement the same way forever. The sketch solution has much in common with the one I will put forward as my preferred solution in 3.3. Both face the challenge of explaining why a picture like Von Hur's depicts horses in one kind of movement, a movement it takes time to see, when what, when what we see in it is a movement of a different kind, a temporally extended movement seen all at once. I address this challenge in section 3-4. However, the present solution is committed to explaining depiction of movement as a matter of seeing in the picture something of duration and in change. 
Oh, I think oh, I see where they're going. I think that commitment is unnecessary, and this marks the main difference between the present solution and the one that I prefer. Alternatively, one might find the commitment implausible rather than just unnecessary on the grounds that many depictions of movement show us something happening at a moment, a cyclist at, a, at great speed caught perfectly clearly with short exposure, say. This brings us to a second way of solving the puzzle. 322A. What we see in the picture is at a moment. Let us now work from the, from the supposition that what we see in pictures is not temporally extended, and more specifically that it occurs at a moment, in time but not over time. What we see in Bonheur's painting, for example, for instance, would then be a horse in position that it holds at one moment of its gallop. Since there can be no change at one moment, a moment can be presented in the same way forever, and hence it is not puzzling how pictures can present movements present moments, but it is puzzling how something that occurs at a moment can look to be in movement. This is what we must explain. And this is what I said very early on, that we're representing motion, we're not actually showing the motion, and it still causes the same problem. So why does it look like it's in movement then? Even if we're saying it's a very, we're just taking a very small time slice of it, why does it look like it's in motion and, and it doesn't look like a time slice of motion? An explanation might seem forthcoming if what we see at a moment is not frozen, a uh, frozen pose, but instead is the instantaneous velocity of an object, its velocity vector, something that has velocity in its movement. But seeing the velocity vector is not to see any velocity, is merely to see some of its properties, namely its direction and magnitude. We need to explain why seeing these properties, or more generally seeing something that occurs at a moment, is to see something in movement. Yeah, because if you're seeing some sort of physical thing, you're seeing a snapshot of the physical properties. And that snapshot of the physical properties, you can write down in numbers. It's not like those change, and you can just be like, those are fixed at that moment. But that's cool. A good starting point for one approach is it, to an explanation is Sheward's atomist view of temporal experience. According to him, even face-to-face -face awareness of movement, su succession, order, duration, and temporal relations generally is generated from momentary perceptual experiences. We are aware of an apple falling, he explains, because we have awareness of a range of successful, successive past and future momentary experiences of the apple's fall. Of course, in a depiction of a moving horse, there's only one movement, one moment of which one has a perceptual experience. Thus, Sheward's view does not have direct application, but perhaps seeing the momentary position of the horse in the picture makes us aware of the memories of horses moving, and this lets us, as Chouard envisages for face-to-face -face enterprises, hey Evan, what's up, thanks for the lurk, face-to-face -face experiences synth synthesize an overall awareness of movement. A similar idea is put forward by Nene. He suggests that in pictures of movement, temporal and mental imagery lets us represent what happened before and after, say, the position that the horse holds in the picture. Even though what we see in the picture happens at one moment, we can have an experience of what would happen just before and after that moment because we have a temporal and mental imagery of this. I don't buy these. Uh, I'm with the author here. I don't buy these explanations. I mean, let's see what the author has to say, though. I mean, if y'all have anything to say, let me know. Because, I mean, you're bringing in memory here. And, uh, that seems like a can of worms. Because you have to explain all of memory. And mental imagery. And why is mental imagery di different from pictorial imagery? Which is a whole thing. So you have to say that mental imagery is some somehow has temporality that is different from pictorial imagery and if these folks are claiming that everything's just a series of moments i don't see how you're going to get a temporal mental uh like the temporal mental imagery because like it makes it special but why i don't understand it seems ad hoc okay that's just my suspicion of what this off this is, the reason i'm thinking this is because the author set it up this way these people are very smart if you're thinking something it's probably because they want you to be thinking it each of Nene's view and my application of Chouard's view to pictures constitutes a psychological solution to the puzzle, in the sense that general psycho psychological mechanisms are taken to suffice for explaining why, for instance, a horse's movement is seen in the picture. This puts those solutions on par with Gombrich's account of depiction of movement. According to him, there is 
a sluggishness of our perception, such that we never perceive moments understood as temporal points. Static images create in us the same memories and anticipations of movement. That he thinks we, due to the sluggishness of our perception, are accustomed to experience face-to-face -face when in contact with momentary stimuli. And this is what I was saying. This is an ad hoc solution to the problem. Just saying there's something special. It is the sluggishness of perception. That is why we experience things one way, whereas pictures and things out in the world are different. So this is um, just declaring perception to be different and special. Okay. I worry that psychological solutions bring us too close to the third option that Wittgenstein presents in the quotation which I, with which I opened, that my visual impression gallops. Rather than the second object, which I think is what we would like, that we see the horse galloping in the picture. Gombrich in particular is explicit about the fact that his solution means attributing to pictures things that are not there. He compares it to how one might hear the top note that a tenor sings in the midst of a difficult aria without the tenor actually producing any sound. Moreover, if general psychological mechanisms suffice for, the explain suffice for explaining why what is seen in some pictures looks to be in movement, the puzzle is treated as a sub-puzzle of a puzzle about experience and desire in section 2. I do not think that this is right. So although psychological solutions remain viable despite the mentioned reservations, I prefer a solution that takes the nature of what is seen in the picture and not only the psychological mechanisms used to process it as a key to explaining depiction of movement. Yeah, and I, th I think this is a fair thing to say. It's like, why would we attribute everything to the brain? It's going way too rationalistic. Like, if, you, if the galloping is always in our head, like, we never actually see a horse gallop, and it's always just some sort of thing that we see versus, uh, like, that we sort of, our brain sort of puts together. It's like, yes, I'm sure our brain does put it together. That's what psychology does. But of what did it put together to begin with? And so it's like, we didn't make everything up in our head. We're not just imagining the horse galloping, and we're all sort of kind of putting this illusion that we think, and that's what, like, a horse galloping is. I mean, that's just sort of very psychological, and it's giving us a lot of credit for, uh, how, like, just sort of making the world up. So I don't think that's right. So, I mean, you could do something like that, and I'm sure it happens a lot, but it's basically saying that we're sort of making the world out of, like, just, like, little spots of what we see in the world, and that's, uh kind of hard to uh, grasp like how do we put the whole world together it's a lot of imagination and it would make the world into a big fantasy which um it's okay you can be very anti-realist like that but it would it seems like how would anything be grounded at this point it'd be hard it, it would be a lot harder it wouldn't be harder i mean it wouldn't necessarily be hard it's just harder to talk about the real world at that point everything's just sort of in our head okay moving on to, uh, three three solution two b what we see in pictures is a temporal my preferred solution to the puzzle has in common with the previous one in that what in that in that oh, excuse me my preferred solution to the puzzle has in common with the previous one that what we see in depictions of movement is taken not to be temporally extended i suggest that we see not moments but rather something atemporal something that is not in time this suggestion could also be coupled with a psychological solution to the puzzle. The idea, very briefly, would be to explain the temporal element of what we see in, in the picture as derived from the temporal properties of our experience when looking at the picture. However, I will focus on a different way of developing the suggestion. Right, I don't even know what that meant right there. The core idea is to identify a severance between movement and change. Note that the reason why it seems puzzling that some that something that looks to be in movement can be seen on in a surface, although there is no possibility of seeing a change of the surface and thereby seeing a change happening to the depicted object, is that a particular assumption is made. Namely, being in movement requires change. Given this assumption, it is contradictory that something that looks to be in movement, that is something changing, can look the same way all of the time, that is, looks unchanged. But it is not clear that we should accept the assumption that gives rise to this contradiction. In order to see why, consider first a non-pictorial example. Perhaps you have noticed during a day in front of the computer how it requires constant effort to maintain good posture. Posture check. Thank you. 
As one of my ballet teachers explained, one needs constantly to feel as though one increases the position, constantly fills it if one is to maintain it, otherwise gravity takes its toll and claps res- takes its toll and claps results. I will say something. It seems like I know a lot of people who are in philosophy of like this area. A lot of the women have done ballet. So <laughs> logic and ballet seem to go together. Um, I mean, I don't know if this is a man or a woman, but like an, in, at least the ones I've met, I, I know a bunch of people who, if they're kind of on the logical side of things, the women at least, they've st- they studied ballet when they were younger. Okay. If one is interested not just in standing still, but also in making a beautiful pose, one can make the upwards stretch visible. By lowering one's shoulders, one makes one's neck as long as possible, elongated but relaxed, one can create a look of extending indefinitely upwards. This is a way of being in movement without changing position, I think. As analyzed by a machine that tracks bodily position and muscle contraction, it might simply be to exert a force, but that it is not how it feels or looks. In a, speci- in a special, skillful way that make that might take a dance student a long time to master, one is in movement in the sense of creating a dynamic stretch upwards, constantly reaching out of the position, although without changing it. I think that a similar way of being in movement without changing is what we see in depictions of movement. For instance, the horses in Bonheur's painting look to be galloping, although their position does not look to change. A difference is that only maintaining one's posture as described occurs at a specific time. But this is no crucial difference, for the fact that maintaining one's posture occurs in time is not what is responsible for its dynamic character. The skillful posing is what is responsible. This kind of movement is thus not essentially temporal. When it is seen in a picture, I think it is atemporal, in the sense that it is not occurring at any specific time. We see something that never changes, but that is constantly, but that constantly is about to do so for each moment that we look at it. The assumption identified as generating a contradiction in our puzzle can thus be rejected, and the puzzle dissolves. Since there is no change to what we see in the picture, there is no obstacle to presenting something that looks to be in movement in the same way forever. For there is no conflict between seeing something that looks to be in an atemporal movement in a picture and there and there being no possibility of seeing that thing change by seeing a change of the surface. Okay, so I think what the author is saying here is that you can get yourself into a position of potential movement, basically, and the potential is atemporal, because you're potentially moving, and it's just sort of stored atemporally. So if you can like get yourself into a position where you are like a spring ready to move, then you people see the movement because they see the potential there of the movement like about to occur. And so that's like an atemporal property that's sort of attached to it. It's a potential movement. <sighs> Is that right? I think that's close. Okay. A distinctive feature of the solution to the puzzle is that nothing needs to be said about the horse's movement before and after what is seen in the picture. This marks a stark contrast to much of the literature on depiction of movement. The focus has often been on how pictures can depict something temporally extended, something that has duration. For instance, Walton considers a range of alternatives as to how the duration of what is depicted and what is experienced in the picture compares with each other. Colvicki similarly focuses on explaining how photographs can depict temporally extended events. Even in a who seems to think that what we see in a picture is something temporally non-extended, aims to explain how the picture, by giving rise to temporal mental imagery, lets us have an experience of what comes before and after, hence of something duration-like. The, and the psychological explanations offered by Gombrich and Le Podevin also focus on how our processing of the static picture can give rise to an experience of something that has duration. In contrast to all of this, my solution does not explain how pictures can let us see something that has duration. It explains how they let us see something in movement that does not change. I do not wish to deny that pictures can, for instance, give rise to temporal mental imagery of what would happen before and after d- the depicted scene. Indeed, I find it very plausible that they do. But making such a claim is not necessary for providing my solution to the puzzle about depiction of movement. Okay. I, I wonder if the author is going to go back and talk about the relative stuff, because I kind of like that better than this one. It's a matter of um, philosophical taste, how much you like uh, the talk of potentials. And uh, 
like powers really like it looks like it has the power to move is really what is like the old kind of term for this so like the horse has the power of movement in it but it is not moving right now and so you see the movement because you see the power like when the um ballet uh performer you can see the power in their movements but you, they don't have to be moving because you can like you know how much power it takes so you see the potential there you see that power so this is sort of a powers argument which is a I was not expecting, but yeah, cool, like, that's exciting, <laughs> I don't always get, like, I don't always get it right, but I'm not always surprised, I'm usually not surprised, but I usually, don't, I don't have to get it right, but surprised is different, I don't mind being wrong, but I'm not usually surprised, so that's kind of interesting, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, and like I said, let me know if uh, that wasn't clear, Okay, challenges to Solution 2B. Like Solution 1, Solution 2B faces the challenge of making room for depiction of ordinary movement. For insofar as what is seen in a picture is identical to what is depicted, only the described kind of changeless atemporal movement can be depicted. That seems like an implausible result for at least some pictures. On hers, the horse fair, for instance, clearly depicts ordinary galloping. The challenge can be overcome by distinguishing b between what a picture depicts and what we see in it. We can claim the following. Depicting a movement involving change requires making a changeless atemporal movement visible in the picture. For instance, in order to depict a horse's gallop, an artist must make visible something else in the picture, namely the horse's changeless movement as its hooves are about to hit the ground but never do. Seeing this in the picture is to depict a depiction of horse's gallop. You like that I like it? <laughs> well, you don't see this sort of argument very often. Because, I mean, you can look right here. This is what the uh, changeless movement. I mean, the fact that you, you can get away with saying something like this, which looks like it's obviously contradictory, is one of the reasons why I find this, uh, like, interesting. Because like the, like the fact that you would have you can the author can get, get away with saying this in a sensical way. So I find this sort of like this this is one of the reasons why powers are interesting because it looks like you can do stuff like this all of a sudden. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I get interested by unusual arguments. I do. The key idea, then, is that what we see in the picture might com come apart from what is depicted. Is such discrepancy possible? Yes. In fact, it also occurs in other cases. As Hopkins suggests, a black and white photograph can depict colored blocks, but what we see in it is not colored. In general, what pictures depict might be less determinate than what we see in them, he claims. Conversely, it could be argued that what we see in pictures might be less determinate than what w they depict. What we see in a picture might have no determinate shade of yellow, although what it depicts, a sunflower, say, does. Arguably, my present claim goes slightly further because something of a different nature, something changeless and atemporal, and actually something less determinate than what is depicted is claimed to be seen in the picture. Nevertheless, the key distinction in, is in both cases is between what is seen and what is depicted. And we're missing a closed parenthesis here, which is so annoying to philosophers like me. Close parenthesis. One might suspect at this point that what I have suggested is closer to a change of subject than a solution. Changeless movement might seem like an inconsistent notion one might think insofar as movement is changed in position over time. This is exactly what I was saying was going on. So whatever dancers detect in the difference between an elongation and the lack of it in a pose, and whatever we see in Bonhoeffer's picture cannot be movement since it does not change. In response to this challenge, I would point out that, although I think there is reason to call what we see in depictions of movement, movement, labeling it thus is not crucial to my solution to the puzzle. What is crucial is that we can explain why seeing it, whatever we call it, is to see a depiction of movement. The idea is that we see something that is about to go somewhere or to change position without in fact doing just that. Yeah, see, this is the aboutness. This is the power. It is about to do something. The power to do it. This is how something that changes position looks when it is all the time presented in the same way. 
Notice, however, that this explanation gives us reason to call what we see in the picture movement. It is related to movement as the follows. It involves visibly being about to change position and thus visibly being about to move in that sense. Having this appearance is not coincidental. It is an integral part of what is what being in changeless, mo changeless movement is, like having the appearance of being green is in integral to being green. This constitutes a reason for taking the appearance to be part of nature of the thing for, and for calling it a kind of movement. Okay, so here the author just bit the bullet. They're saying, okay, changeless movement, but it's not really movement anymore. We're going to call it, this is like the predecessor to movement. It's like the power to move is about to exist, like to, to about to happen. And so they're just saying, you know what? What you're seeing is not actually movement. You're seeing the potential to move and the potential is about to happen. And that's really what we're seeing. And that is a temporal, the power, because powers are a temporal. You always have the power with you. And that is how they're getting out of this uh the dilemma here because it's not actually movement you're seeing even though it is everything that goes along with movement because the power to do this sort of movement is you understand what the movement is at that point and you understand everything about the movement okay because that's what the power does it is that mo the power to do that particular movement okay four movement instills in outlining the puzzle above, I relied upon an intuitive idea that some depictions are special and depict movement, but in fact I think that there is an element of movement in many more pictures than examples discussed thus far. I will, en I will end this paper by indicating how I think the suggestion that we see changeless atemporal movement can be applied to further cases. This will help illuminate what the suggestion is. What would it be to depict something that is static like a picture is? Pictures are static, we saw above, in the sense that there is no possibility of seeing the depicted object changed by seeing a change of the surface. Hence, in depictions of things like galloping horses or rolling waves, there seems to be a conflict between the picture's manner of presentation and what it presents. Something that looks to be in movement is, all the time, looking the same way. The question that I am raising now is this. If we wanted to avoid this conflict, what sort of depicta would we have to pick? My sense is that picking standard motifs like a person seated, a tranquil landscape, or a bowl of fruit will not do. Very few of the objects and scenes that we perceive face to face are static in the sense that they, all of the time, are presented in the same way. People blink, the wind blows across the landscape, and the light moves across the fruit bowl. Moreover, these relatively tranquil depicta are often portrayed by artists as non-static, especially with regard to portraiture. A good portrait picture portrait a good picture portrays its subject as hoping, feeling, thinking, looking somewhere, aspiring to something in short as living. This motivates suggesting that even in pictures where no movement, movement is depicted, what is seen in the picture can be something in a temporal movement. In order to depict a lifelike person or landscape, something else is made visible in the picture, something that never changes but constantly is about to for each moment that we look at it. Some support for this suggestion, and especially for extending to pictures of inanimate objects, can be found in instructions given to artists. In The Natural Way to Draw, a famous textbook on drawing, um, Nicolades teaches his students gesture drawing by giving them instructions like the following. Try to draw the actual thrust of the jaw, the declension of the hand. A drawing of prize fighters should show the push from foot to fist behind their blows that make them hurt. Hello, Kuda. What's up? And this is what I was talking about, power. This is exactly it. You got a paper, of the, yeah, that's the paper we're reading today. This is on um, depicting movement in uh, pictures. So in this, so you see this, the prize fighter showing the push from foot to, fit, <clears throat> foot to fist behind the blows that make them hurt. This is exactly what I was talking about when I said it's a power argument. This is exactly right, right, right there. Later, when teaching his students to how to draw inanimate objects, he provides a strikingly similar instruction, focusing on what the object is doing. Look at the lamp and thinking of what it is doing. It spreads out to hold a certain amount of kerosene. The glass chimney holds back the wind from the flame. The base of the lamp may have a sturdy, smug look, which suggests to you a well-fed, prosperous businessman with a neat collar holding his head up straight. This is grist to my mill in two ways. First, Nicolade's description suggests that a similar effort is involved in drawing a prize fighter blows as in drawing a lamp's posture. 
Thus, there is continuity between moving depicta and relatively static ones. This is also part of what I suggest. Second, in the case of the lamp, Nick Lades asks his students to give it the look of doing something, although it is not changing. This is to make the lamp look to be in changeless movement, as I would put it. See, I would call this potential movement, not changeless. An additional reason for extending my solution to the puzzles as suggested is that it gives us a new handle on temporality in pictures. For instance, the depiction of events. As Gombrich argues, even events are often and best depicted by juxtaposing different temporal parts of it. It is striking that such depic depictions of events do not come across as unfaithful. My suggestion can explain this. If what we see in pictures is something atemporal, there is nothing unfaithful about showing in the same picture visual, present, visual presentations that could only be seen at different times face to face. Although I have provided no exhaustive discussion of the topic, I hope to have made it seem promising to extend the suggestion that changeless, changeless atemporal movement can be seen in pictures to depict in pictures to depictions of relatively tranquil scenes and objects. Its promise stems both from its coherence with instructions like those in Nicolade's, that Nicolade provides and its flexibility in accounting for temporality in pictures. But the main reason for making the extinction is that it seems very difficult to think of depicted that are static like a picture's manner of presentation is, things that, forever and to all time, are presented in the same way. Such things are eternal. When presenting eternal objects like God or angels, artists usually resort to uh, depicting them as perishable like ourselves. If I am right that we see pictures or can look to see in pictures can look to be an atemporal movement, and if what we see in pictures can be identical to what is depicted, then a truthful depiction of God should be possible, or rather one truthful to his temporal aspects. However, as I said, what is seen in pictures can and often does differ from what is depicted. Thus, while what we see may be horses in a temporal movement, what is depicted can be horses in ordinary gallop. Okie dokie. That was fun. Um, did not end up where I thought it would end up. Um, but that's cool. That's kind of exciting. I always like a, I like surprises in my philosophy. Um, yeah, cool. So basically, what happened here is that in order to depict motion in something that doesn't, you have to depict power. And since power is a um, potential, potentials don't need any uh, motion to be shown. But they do represent, they are, it's like, you can think of like a uh, balloon about to pop or something about to explode. Like you can see it like shaking. You can see like the stress in like the container and it's not moving, but you can see the stress in the container. And so you see it is about to explode. So you can think of something like that. Um, and you're saying, well, it's not in motion, but you can see the power and it's about to blow. And that's sort of what's going on here. It's uh, the built up potential for m motion is kind of what's going. This author is saying is how paintings, which are don't move, show motion. Now, I have a small beef because I, I actually quite like the first um, solution that the author presented here, the one that was relative. Uh, yeah, not this one. It was this one up here. This relative one, before, now, and after. Because how do you even show power? You have to show power somehow. And so I'm not entirely sure how power is shown. They're just saying it's a changeless... <coughs> the changeless, changeless movement, but like... <laughs> What does that change those movement? What are we showing then? So exactly how is this power represented? Um, it's like, yes, we can come apart from other things. So like, yeah. So if you're trying to represent something moving in a static picture, you have to show um, something that isn't there. And that's what they're saying. But... <coughs> It's a change of subject. So you're, what this author does is say, okay, they're shifting the object of what's happening. You're showing the power. But exactly how is that shift happening? How is that happening? And that's where I like the relative solution above, saying, look, you're representing more things. And this is kind of like, why did Picasso not come into this um, discussion at all? Why is there not uh, a discussion of uh, cubism here? 
because cubism and there's a famous paint uh series of photos or whatever oh no well there's also the photos there's something called women descending the stairs is it who did that woman descending the stairs and it's like you can see the same one it's a painting of like a woman a cubist woman walking downstairs but it's like a bunch of the different women i'm sorry i'm not on the screen so it's like it's like a woman going downstairs like da, 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 da. and so you see her over and over and over and over and over so you're seeing her go down the stairs in like just cubist motion but you see all the time at once so it's like it's extended it so you see the motion why because it's there it's there in the painting but it's like, well, you're saying, this author would say, well, it's showing the mov- motion. It's not showing, no. This author would say it's um, it's moving, not depicting the motion. But that's not right. If it does, it's showing that the woman can do this. It's like the changeless movement is changing the subject. But I'd say that's the same thing here. How, how do you show a woman going downstairs? Does she have the power to walk down the stairs? Well, that's what the cubist person is doing by showing her in like, multiple time slices in the same painting so yeah it's giving because the cubist painting is a temporal too it's just got multiple time slices in it's a temporality <laughs> yeah see movement and stills so this is exactly what's happening here i think you're you're showing even in picture where no movement is depicted what is seen in the picture can be something in a temporal movement which is to have a power to move through different parts of our world um yeah so but how are you doing this you got some you got some point to rant about since we finished yeah go right ahead let me know so yeah I, i just have a question exactly how is this uh, topic shift actually happening without the relative um, argument that's coming up here. You have to show relative movement, like the li- the woman coming down the stairs before, now, and after, all at once. So, and that's kind of what I'm thinking. That you still you're not, the author won't get away from the relative uh, point that was being made here. Excuse me. But other than that, I mean, we can talk about general uh, aspects of this paper. I mean, I kind of like, how is this relative to Wittgenstein? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, let's go back to the Wittgenstein. When I see the picture of a galloping horse, do I only know that this is the kind of movement meant? Is it, is it superstition to think they see the horse galloping in the picture? And does my visual impression gallop too? Okay, so Wittgenstein is asking, where is the galloping happening here? And... The author goes through this a little bit. This is, does my visual impression gallop too? So this is the psychological treatment. Is it that you are making up the uh, galloping in your mind? Is that where it occurs? And how do I know this is a kind of move? How do you even know what kind of movement it is? And is it superstition that I see the horse galloping in the picture? So if the horse is actually galloping in the picture, but the picture is static, that's impossible. So you're just making up the mat. Is it magic in the world that is making you see the horse galloping in the picture? When, of course, it's a, p- a static picture and there's no galloping. Or are you making it up in your head? And so the question is, for Wittgenstein, is how are you seeing something? You see something as something. How are you seeing the horse as galloping? Okay. So, Wittgenstein was asking, when you look in um, in this section, part two, you're, it's, a, it's a discussion of seeing as. So, when you look at a duck rabbit, speaking of, where are my duck rabbits at? Oh, not PogChamp, just duck rabbit. Sorry. So, when you look at a duck rabbit, you see it either as a bunny or you see it as a duck. So either rat, you see it as a rabbit or you see it as a duck. And so the question is here, how do you see... Isn't this more related to the Greek with the turtle on the arrows? It, it, uh, well, yes, this is all... There's a lot of stuff that gets related here. Um, but the, 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 I think the author is taking the Wittgenstein because a, a Wittgenstein talked about the horse galloping. Um, for all I know, he was actually talking about some old uh, picture of a horse galloping. One was his Bond horse fair. For all we know that Wittgenstein was actually talking about this picture. I mean, Wittgenstein was like massively rich. He might have seen all the art. Um, so he may have actually seen this painting. 
and that may have been what he was talking about. Um, so the question is for Wittgenstein is seeing as here. And so when you see something as in motion, is that an illusion of some sort? Is it psychological? Is it magical? And the author here is trying to say you're seeing it as a potential, which is none of these things. Although it's kind of the closest thing is to the uh, your visual impression is galloping. You're seeing a potential in the picture of a horse galloping. And that is what is doing the motion because the potential is atemporal and the potential allows you to imagine the sort of potential being uh, going into non-potential, like actual motion. So, um, trying to remember all my Greek stuff and I'm failing. Do you have a better, like, question about that? Because I just can't get my Greek to come to the surface at the moment. <laughs> I apologize. So, this is, but I can at least speak on the Wittgenstein because I do have some idea about that. So, the question is, like, if you look at the, from one, like, if you, where is it the duck rabbit a duck and where is it, um, a rabbit? And so if you look at the duck rabbit and you say, hey, look, it's in the world. It's both a duck and a rabbit. Well, isn't that like the motion of the horse galloping? It's in the in the picture of it being if, if, if it's something that isn't there. Now, you could say, look, it is there both in the duck rabbit for it is one way and it is the other way. But you only see one at a time. Usually you can't see both a duck and a rabbit. And so you have to like do work to try to do that. And so the question is, is that a psychological thing? Where is the duck rabbit then? And the question is, where is the motion when you don't, there is no actual motion? Oh, you like the, <laughs> I enjoyed the paper. Yeah, well, I like, I like the surprise. And I thought it was a good paper. And, you know, when things come out, uh, come around to the way I look at stuff, I'm always happy too that, like, I somewhat agree with this author. I don't agree with power talk, but, uh, the relative stuff that was close, I agree with that part. So, um, I thought that was good. So, Yeah. I mean, I thought it was fun. I thought it was fun paper. I like it when things go my way. It doesn't have to go exactly my way, but I like how it came my way. Um, to me, this is why this like analytic stuff dries your wine, man. This is really, really dry wine too. And I do like dry wine. <laughs> so. I see I have a few viewers. If anyone has any other questions besides DeMarshall, you're free to ask. Um, please let me know. I'm just reading the paper and uh, see how things go. Um, yeah, the you know, there's different goals in philosophy. Like, the analytic stuff is good for certain things. Other stuff is good for other things. You have to... It's Very few people are just, like, purely analytic, to tell you the truth. Or So it's like people get their... Uh, at least when they grow up a little bit. When you're young, you, you do, like, certain things. You do what you like. When you grow up, you go and you dabble. So. All right, let me see. Is there anything else to say? Yeah, I, I find the lack of pictures in the paint, uh, paper about lots of pa paintings sort of disappointing. They could have had some... They could have found some uh, pictures that were out of copyright that they could have brought in here. But I mean, other than that, I, I mean, as you said, um, this is a this is actually a analytic phenomenology. This is a philosophy of art, and uh, and also sort of how we view art. So this is philosophy of art, and sort of the phenomenology of um, yeah, aesthetic phenomenology, discussing how we see movement in things so this is how we this is why Wittgenstein was brought up at the beginning this is because it's, it's talking about how we see uh things as subjectively moving even when they are not so it's not exactly psych it's not math it is it's not exactly talking about the aesthetics of it it is talking about our experience of of motion where there is none so it's phenomenology Wittgensteinian phenomenology. <coughs> so, let's see who... Anything interesting referenced here? Nah. Yeah, but you can see image mind, image picture experience. So, it's going to be a lot of uh, philosophy of uh, arts. 
Yeah, I try to get... <laughs> try to read stuff, you know? Let's see. Anybody... Okay, no. N nothing, uh... Nothing too much to know in this. Uh, just by, like, the references or the, uh, comments. Okay. Uh, let's see. So that's it for this one. What time is it, anyway? Uh, 23.29. Okay, it's 11.30 here. So. Let's go back. Um. You know what? Should I read... An I, let's see if I can go read the, uh... Yeah, and so you can see, alright, so a motion in the picture. Where is the motion? Do we see potential from the water falling here, or is it something else? What is going on in this? I'm not entirely sure that, like, um, like, do we see the potential for, what are we seeing here? That we see, like, the uh, motionless change. Yeah, see, I'm not sure that works so well for these sorts of images, actually. Because it looks like the geometry is actually playing an active role here. And so that's kind of interesting. And this is why I, I like the relative solution better, because I think it works better for these sorts of things. But again, the author was very careful to talk about only the kind of images they were talking about. So, anywho. 